so I, I was uh, I was bragging to Cole about how you you started at as one of our first new speakers and then immediately went up, go on to like speak at all of these other awesome conferences and like totally go on the circuit now. Yes. <laughs> uh, what a crazy year it's been. Yeah, I've went from um, just starting out, I think like a couple of years ago and GrimCon was my first talk. And now I have my own blog. I'm starting my own podcast uh, this fall, uh, created my own framework. So things are happening fast. Amazing. <laughs> That's so cool. Well, we're going to pass, pass the torch yet again to your now experienced and awesome speaking hands. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, once again, uh, they probably already introduced me, but my name is Nicole Hoffman and I'm giving a presentation titled, Jinkies, this email looks suspicious. So there's been a suspicious email sent by to somebody at Mystery Inc. And I need your help to unmask the imposter and solve the mystery. And stick around and I'll provide some tips to help prevent this from happening to you and your organization. So a little bit more about me, why should you listen to me during this talk? Um, I'm currently an intelligence analyst at GroupSense, which is a digital risk protection services company. I personally deal uh, with uh, business email compromise uh, probably on a weekly basis. And so I just thought it'd be really relevant to give this talk and to provide some helpful tips. I have a, a bachelor's in information technology and a minor in cybersecurity. I have my Security Plus certification. Uh, like I said uh, previously, I recently created my uh, a cognitive stairways of analysis framework. This is an analytic framework to provide a step-by-step -step process for performing analysis in tech. Uh, if you wanna know more about it, you can go to my blog at threathuntergirl.com. Um, and something about me personally, uh, before I can do any type of analysis, I need the coffee. I need coffee before I can do the intelligence analysis. Um, when I'm not working, I just recently moved to the Dallas-Fort Worth area with my family, so we've been spending a lot of weekends exploring, and it's been really fun. I'm a huge comic book fan, um, both the physical comic books that I collect as well as the cinematic universes. And I'm a big gamer. I love Destiny 2. I love um, uh, Red Dead Redemption, Assassin's Creed. Not that you needed to know all the games that I like to play, but I just thought I would mention it. And uh, you can reach me on Twitter at threathuntergirl.com or threathuntergirl without the I. OK, so let's talk about this suspicious email. It came from Scooby-Doo and it was sent to Joe in HR. And it says, Dear Joe, I have a new bank account. I need changed urgent. So next paycheck go new account. Please confirm change by email only. Thank, Scooby-Doo. Hmm. This email looks really suspicious. And the first thing that I noticed when looking at this email is the domains don't match. So this clearly didn't come from Scooby-Doo because they inserted a dash into the domain. So that looks odd. The next thing that looks odd is Scooby-Doo doesn't get paid in money. He gets paid in Scooby snacks. Everybody knows that. And I know Scooby-Doo's grammar is not the best, but it's not this bad. So that's another red flag. And look at the unexplained urgency. This just seems out of the norm for Scooby-Doo. The only thing Scooby-Doo does urgently is eat, and really shaggy for that matter, or maybe run away from bad guys, but he certainly doesn't care about getting paid urgently. So that's another red flag. The biggest red flag is that um, we have at uh, Mr. Inc., they have an internal policy for confirming identification for any financial changes or contact information, and it says, please confirm change by email only. If this was really Scooby-Doo, he would know how to properly confirm the change. So this isn't Scooby-Doo. And Scooby-Doo actually doesn't have an email at Mystery Inc. He doesn't actually have a computer. His paws are too big. So 
All of these things lead us to believe that this is most likely someone impersonating Scooby-Doo in a business email compromise trying to intercept his payment. So let's talk a little bit more about business email compromise. Have you ever seen the movie, The Master of Disguise? It's a movie, I, I'm not sure when it came out, um, but I watched it when I was little and I just thought it was the funniest thing ever. And it was about a, a guy who was learning the family business of being able to change his uh, into dis special disguises almost at the snap of a finger and just ridiculously unrealistically fast. And it's really funny if you watch it, I recommend watching it with your kids. Um, but that's kind of what I feel like threat actors feel like when they commit these email compromise attacks is that they're some master of disguise that um, is, they're trying to blend in and you know manipulate people. Um, and so who better to unmask an imposter than Mystery Inc. So that's kind of why I really wanted to do a Scooby-Doo talk. And the other reason is I also say like jinkies all the time during my investigation. So now I get to <laughs> say it during a talk. So business email compromise, what it is, it's an email-based social engineering attack where a threat actor will impersonate a legitimate employee um, in order to uh, interrupt or um, uh, reroute funds. And there's two scenarios that I typically see on a, on a weekly basis. There is the wire fraud where they'll try to intercept a payment to like a vendor or a company, or even like if someone's trying to pay off their house um, in, a, in a reality situation. Um, the other one that I see a lot is payroll fraud where they'll try to uh, access that person's direct deposit and say, hey, I got a new bank account like we saw with the person impersonating Scooby-Doo. And these threat actors are typically financially motivated um, and they are ranging from all technical abilities. I've seen well-executed business email compromise attacks and I've seen poorly executed uh, attacks. So it, it really is not something that you have to have a lot of technical abilities to carry out. Um, three of the main things that I see uh, for how they carry out the attack is one is I've seen them create uh, spoofed domains or domains that are created to look like the legitimate domain and they do this to try to bypass the detection from the person they're sending the email to or uh, private emails such as Gmail, Yahoo. Um, this is uh, something I see more in the payroll fraud, especially since a lot of the workforce is remote now and they'll say, hey, this is my home email. Um, and then compromised credentials. Uh, this is something I don't see as often or uh, maybe it's not as uh, reported, but if a threat actor gains access to an email credential, they can then uh, send out emails from uh, that person's email. So who is at risk? Well, really, everyone that has a business email is technically at risk, but the two departments that I see targeted the most is HR, who have the ability to ch make changes to people's direct deposit accounts, and accounting or accounts payable, somebody who has access to make changes within an organization's uh, wires if, if they're sending money to uh, vendors and, and things like that. Um, so those are the two people that I see that are at risk the most, but it's really something that can affect anyone in the organization. And according to the FBI's uh, 2020 Internet Crime Report, in 2020 alone, uh, the IC3 received 19,369 business email compromise complaints, and the adjusted losses for those was just over $1.8 billion. And just for comparison, last year, they also received 2,474 complaints uh, identified as ransomware and the adjusted losses of over $29.1 million. So just to compare 19,000 complaints versus 2,000. So this is something we really need to be prepared for. Um, and there's a lot of different types of prevention strategies that you can uh, implement, but I'm gonna start simple and I'm going to be providing you with five uh, prevention tips that I think could significantly reduce the 
the likelihood of a successful business email compromise and potentially save your organization thousands of dollars. So let's look at the first prevention tip. Continuously monitor for information exposure. If you find information exposure, try to mitigate it. Remove the data if possible. Um, try to uh, make sure that it doesn't happen in the future. Um, things that you specifically want to be looking for is oversharing. Oversharing on LinkedIn, other social media, are people posting pictures of their badge, their job titles, um, their emails, and, and things like that. Um, how easy is it for threat actors to find the information to figure out who they need to target to be the most successful? You know, um, sites like data brokers or business to business uh, databases, these are sites that are meant for legitimate business purposes, but threat actors can exploit them typically for free or for a small cost, if you've ever seen these. And a lot of these sites have opt out options, which I recommend. It does take some time to go through and find them all. And it does require continuously monitoring for this information, but knowing is half the battle. So I highly recommend knowing how much information is out there. Um, and are you oversharing on your corporate website? How much information are you sharing about your staff? specifically human resources and accounting. And the executives, how much can I find just by going to your website? It, you know, Try to put yourself in a threat actor's shoes and try to determine what they can find. A lot of times what, what I have seen is people will post like um, company spotlights or employee spotlight, like these are, you know, I want to share about our company, which is great, but then they'll say like, this is Sasha from accounting and she just started and she's from Ohio and she went to Ohio, she has a degree from Ohio State and all these things are, are great. They're, or they're innocent when, you, when you're posting them and, and it's a good idea to share about your company, but just be cognizant of how much you're sharing and how easy you're making it. Um, and if you experience a business email compromise, try to go back and, and look for how much information you can find about the individual that was targeted. Um, and credential exposures is something, another type of exposure that I think everyone should be regularly monitoring, especially if uh, employees, as they often do, reuse passwords. If, you know, say there's a, a Facebook breach or some app breach, are they reusing that password internally? Um, and will a threat actor be able to gain access? And so, this has to be a, a continuous uh, monitoring. I don't think it's a one and done um, because information can pop up all the time. So continuously monitoring, mitigating, and preventing this could, could uh, significantly reduce the likelihood of these types of attacks. So don't make it easier for threat actors. My second prevention tip is to ensure the company has policies for the identity verification when you make these types of changes like uh, existing invoices, direct deposit bank accounts, contact information, say, hey, this is my new email, stuff like that, like we saw with, with the threat actor targeting Scooby-Doo. If you have specific policies and procedures in place, um, it's more, more likely that, uh, you know, uh, these types of things won't just happen because they'll know I need to make sure this is verified. Personally, I like to have a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C with uh, identity verification. You know, you can uh, verify over the phone with a known phone number for that individual, not a phone number provided within the email, um, like in the signature or, or the website. You don't want to use that information. If you don't have the specific phone number for the individual that um, is trying to contact you, try to get a, a known contact at that company or even just Google the company, try to use their main line. You just don't want to use anything provided in the email if you're suspicious uh, that it might be a business email compromise. Uh, the plan B would be in person if at all possible. Um, if, if it's a remote workforce, obviously that's, that's something that can happen. And then plan C, I recommend having something specific and unique to your organization. Um, 
that changes regularly, but not too much, because if you change it too much, then people are just going to be annoyed by it and they're not going to pay attention. But if it's if it's regular enough, at least change it when someone if, if someone leaves the company, then let's go ahead and update that, whether it be like a code word or just some type of unique thing that you can add, like an additional layer of identity verification. And, you know, so, hearing code word, it might sound like childish or that doesn't seem like it's going to work. But in reality, something so simple could actually, you know, prevent this type of attack. Um, so think about it, you know, think about having multiple plans, not just one form of identity verification, because there's always going to be exceptions and you don't want to have too many plans or too many, uh, backup plans because that is just going to be annoying and they're not going to, you know, be able to uh, remember all of them. So just have enough to try to cover ex exceptions and things like that. Um, so there's always a plan in place. So my third prevention tip is education. Now I highly recommend educating the entire staff on not only uh, regular phishing attacks, but also business email compromise attack. Because it's these types of attacks are different than the normal um, phishing attacks that you see in the wild. Because typically, when there's a phishing attack, the threat actors are phishing for information. They're trying to get information or they're trying to uh, manipulate you into like clicking on something. Um, and so a lot of the phishing awareness training that I see is specific to, um, you know, tr trying to get credentials or you trying to get you to open something malicious. And it doesn't really cover business email compromise and, and when the, the threat actor is actually going after money instead of information or uh, you know, trying to get you to download malware. So I highly recommend specifically for the uh, human resources and accounting departments to incorporate specific business email compromise um, examples into your training. And also if you do phishing awareness, or if not phishing awareness, excuse me, um, phishing uh, simulations like for training, I highly recommend not only doing the, you know, the typical phishing, but also including a specific business email compromise into the most targeted people in the organization, um, because it could definitely help prevent the, the attack, because this type of attack exploits the network's weakest link, which is the people, and it relies on manipulating people. And it, we're never going to be able to say we're 100% covered from this threat, but we can do all that we can so that um, we can hope to prevent the likelihood. So my fourth prevention tip is to continuously monitor for newly created spoofed domains that uh, specifically have mail servers set up. Because a lot of times what I will see is a threat actor will create a domain that looks exactly like a legitimate domain, whether you call that a spoof domain, typo squatted domain, whatever you want to call it. Um, they'll set it up, they'll register it, they'll set up mail servers, they'll create the email of the individual that they're trying to impersonate, and they'll carry out their attack typically within a few days. So making sure that you're monitoring for these, um, and because knowing is half the battle, and something uh, like this, you want to just be continuously monitoring for anyway, um, because there's other things that could potentially impact your organization. Um, so no Scooby-Doo talk would be complete without a trip to the kitchen, because that's typically where you're going to find Shaggy and Scooby during any mystery solving investigation. So I had to go into the kitchen to see Scooby and Shaggy's epic sandwich creation. Uh, so for my fifth prevention tip, I really recommend being wary of unexplained urgency and requests for payments or financial changes, even contact changes. Any unexplained urgency should be immediately a red flag. And for me, if I see any unexplained urgency, I would immediately 
stop communicating with that individual over email and start my identity verification procedures that I have in place. Um, because it might be, uh, it might take a couple extra steps, it might be inconvenient, but security isn't supposed to be convenient. And if it can save the company hundreds of thousands of dollars, I would do that. So I highly recommend in your training uh, for business email compromise to add the red flag of unexplained urgency because threat actors often, not just in business email compromise, but other types of phishing attacks, they'll often use unexplained urgency, they'll, they'll um, impersonate a person uh, that's in a position of power and they'll they'll use that urgency and authority to try to manipulate people into doing something quicker so that they don't have time to just you know think about it and and identify any red flags um, and that's what they're hoping for so be wary of that unexplained urgency and requests and especially if it's coming from a, a person of power start looking immediately for any red flags in the email Why, it's Old Man Withers, the guy that, with the haunted uh, amusement park. He was behind the attack the whole time, and he would have gotten away with it if it wasn't for those meddling kids. So this is hopefully what uh, a threat actor will say if you implement these five prevention tips. So just, just to wrap it up and, and kind of reiterate the five steps is you want to be continuously monitoring for information exposure. I highly recommend you regularly Google your company, Google uh, people that are specifically targeted, um, like you know people in your accounting department, your executives, people in human resources, how much information is out there and how easy is it for a threat actor to carry out this attack? with little to no resource, excuse me, little to no resources. And number two, you know, ensure you have company policies and procedures in place, not only for uh, verifying identities, but also for responding to business email compromise, or if there's an expected phishing email, how uh, do they continue or how do they uh, report those? So make sure you have those policies in place. And number three, education. You want to make sure you have a well thought out cybersecurity uh, uh, phishing awareness training, but also specifically for business email compromise, because it's a lot different than other types of phishing attacks, because it typically happens when a threat actor is phishing for money and not so much information or uh, trying to give, give out malware or anything like that. So the training should be different. Um, and included specifically for those people in human resources and accounting. And number four, continuously monitoring for those newly created uh, suspicious spoofed domains that look eerily like your domain that a threat actor uh, might use to detect or to bypass detection from someone if they're not paying attention closely enough. Uh, pay attention to those, specifically the ones that set up mail servers, um, if you experience a business email compromise and um, they are using a spoof domain, you can reach out to that domain registry. You can request that they take it down. Um, you could sh you know, share the information about it. Um, typically, most of the domain registries do have a way of reporting abuse, so you can go ahead and do that. And number five, you know, be wary of that unexplained urgency and requests for payments and, and financial changes. Really just any unexplained urgency, specifically it's for, if it's from someone in power. So I'm going to make my slides available after my talk on my blog at threathundergirl.com later this evening. I'll post it on social media as well as Discord um, that when it's live, if you don't follow social media, you can just go ahead and navigate to my blog later. I collected some helpful resources that were are useful for me on a, on a daily basis, but also really interesting when I was creating this presentation. Um, specifically, I wanted to point out the um, 
Bloomberg article by Evan Ratcliffe, and it's called The Fall of the Billionaire Gucci Master. It just recently published, and it's really interesting. It's about a guy who um, was carrying out business email compromise, and he ended up making millions of dollars and became an influencer. And so highly recommend that uh, read if, if you can access it. So that wraps it up for me. Uh, I think I'm really early, but better better to be early than late. So thank you everyone. Thank you GrimCon for helping me solve the mystery of this uh, business email compromise impacting poor Scooby-Doo. I mean, we knew it was gonna be old man withers. We knew. <laughs> we knew, it always is. You pull it off and there he is every time. Yeah, I had to. I was like, it's gotta be old man withers. I can't have a Scooby talk <laughs> without the old man withers. So I'm going to create an award on the spot uh, for the five conferences we've had. This is the best aesthetic we've ever had on a slide. Yes. This is this was awesome. It's incredible. It's incredible. Yes, I, I you got I gotta love uh, PowerPoint's uh, 3D models and stuff. The only thing, the tip that I will say to for people is if you're using the 3D models and you're using a bunch of them to kind of create a scenario like a scene. After you're done with the slide, take a screenshot, erase the slide, and then post the screenshot because it makes PowerPoint like crash if you're using too many 3D models. So good to know. But good for if you're trying to avoid copyright infringement. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, are you are you going to be? Yeah. So uh, tell us about the the podcast. Actually, by the by the way, you mentioned that before. Yes, so I'm starting a podcast. Um, I was hoping to start it sooner, but then I ended up moving to Texas a little sooner. So once my house is built, I'm going to have my own little podcast studio. Uh, the podcast is going to be called IT Wolves, and I'm actually starting it with my husband. His name's Bruce. He's in the cyberspace as well. Um, he's not as active on Twitter, but he is a senior cybersecurity engineer slash architect. So he's really um, on the engineering side, whereas I'm more, you know, on the analytic uh, intelligence side. So I just we thought it'd be really interesting to start a podcast where we kind of discuss topics from both of our points of view, because I feel like a lot of times when I'm giving intelligence advice to my clients and, and uh, other and other people in the field, that there's this um, there's this area that's that's missing from an operational like engineering like. I'm going to give you what I think is the best, but is it the best for your organization? What, you know, what are those things that I don't see because I'm not, you know, messing with firewalls every day and, you know, especially things like patch management. And there's a lot of debate around that. And there's always the best practices from intelligence side, but, you know, what is the realistic side? So I'm really excited about it. Um, it should be launching sometime towards the end of the year. It's super exciting and really interesting. I, I always love those uh, podcasts or shows that have that dichotomy of like the same scenario, but two completely different perspectives. I think it's so interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping it'll be pretty casual. I don't want it to be, I want it to be kind of a fun way to like continuously share um, tips and stuff without it being too like businessy. So hopefully lots of husband and wife bickering over <laughs> uh, over cybersecurity topics but in a fun, in the best way possible and hopefully have some uh, other cybersecurity people um on there to talk about different fun topics jinkies yeah jinkies uh just a, a thought on this your uh the recording of this would be uh an excellent employee training tool yes oh well thank you that that makes me feel good. Yeah, and and that's kind of another reason why I wanted to mention that, or I wanted to create this talk is because when I see phishing training, it's always the same, you know, ransomware based or don't click the link, which is great. We need that, but this is something that can also be just as damaging financially. Um, so we want to make sure. I know when I was when I was uh, making the talk, I reached out to a couple of my friends that are not in tech. They're actually in the financial sector, and they had no idea what business email compromise was. So, and they're the ones getting targeted the most. Yeah, exactly. So like. it's definitely something I I I want to scream from the rooftops about to try to prevent this from happening. 
Uh, question from the audience. Can you address the recent issues around phishing education that trick employees and why people should be thinking about these issues? So some of the ethics of phishing training. Well, I, and I say this a lot, and I said this in a, a talk I recently gave, um, is we shouldn't be fear mongering. Education should be empowering because if people are scared, it's it's they're not going to want to report things and you want people to report things you want people to know that you're on their side if they see something report it even if they clicked on it they shouldn't live in fear because when they do they're not going to report it things aren't going to happen and if they feel empowered you know even through the use of like gamification you know have awards or something even if it's just like a little snickers bar like make people feel excited to identify threats yeah, that's great advice. The positive criticism rather than the, you know, yes. bad, bad, bad. Yes, a reinforcement. That's what I'm thinking. Negative reinforcement versus positive reinforcement. Yeah. Exactly. Seriously. Don't fear monger. Mm -hmm. it, 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 I understand why people do it because they think it'll get what they want and it might, but is it the best thing? Because really at the end of the day, we want to bring cybersecurity and other departments together, not further apart. We want to get rid of the attitude that it's just a money pit that nobody that makes our life harder. That shouldn't be the the mantra. Yep. Great points. Bring everybody together. Bring everybody exactly. together. Educate and inspire instead of tearing people down. Yes. Cybersecurity should be part of the values of the company. It should be company wide. It shouldn't just be something on the back burner. Yes. Well, and also, uh, I think that helps set up more of a service-oriented security uh, relationship. Uh, too often, security is the the culture and the place of no. And at the end of the day, uh, users are going to get done what they need to get done. I, I joke that users are the best. A user that you say no to is the best hacker on the planet, because they will find a way around whatever controls you have. And phishing and business email compromise, of course, are the most common access methods for initial access because you only need one click. I can, it costs me just as much to send 10 million emails as it does to send one email. And we blame the user for essentially using a computer for how it was designed. Exactly. That's and a that's broken why model. you, you want to yeah. have, you know, those procedures in place that are simple easily accessible, easy to remember, because if you have too many, they're not going to remember it. They're going to try to get around it. If you, Just like if you use, I've seen companies use like a daily code word, which is great, but it gets old after a while and then people are just going to be annoyed by it. So you want to make it easy, simple, not something that they're going to try to get around if, if possible. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's like the easiest way to to have a, a security culture fail and an organization fail. You know what I mean? Like if you make it too hard, uh, it's a fine line, you know, like if you want to make it where it's secure, but you want to make sure that the users aren't going to, as Bryson said, find find workarounds. It's it's got there has to be a nice like there has to be a nice um, uh, balance there. And I think on the flip side, when we are educating the end users as as you were here, they can educate us too, right? Like what how, what kind of language should we be using to communicate with them and make it where it isn't this like negative, you clicked on a link, you did this, blah, 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 and it's more like, okay, so let me put this in your terms, okay? Let me explain this to you. Um, I think that's hugely valuable. You know, we can all learn from each other. Exactly. And there should be like, you know, my first thing would be, and, and I'm not in that engineering spot, like you said, but if I was and I was receiving that call, I would be so grateful. I would be like, thank you. It probably took a lot of courage for you to call and admit that this happened, but it's extremely valuable. Um, and so that that's something else I think that we don't do enough because, you know, having not only, you know, making sure we're not fear mongering, but also making sure we're showing gratitude when people do do the things that they're supposed to do. Have you, uh, have you, <laughs> have you looked at DMARC at all as a system solution? As far, um, I don't, <laughs> again, I'm more on the intelligence side, so I'm not so much on the, um, 
on the uh, engineering side, making the specific security controls. But um, I do think there is a lot of specific controls. Um, in, in my resources, um, specifically, uh, the one that I used the most was the FBI recently came out with in March, there was a private industry notification for BEC, and they had a lot of great recommendations, not only for general uh, public, but also specifically for uh, system admins and people that are making those specific um, security controls to prevent this type of attack. 